Advanced Azure Services is being broken up into three distinct areas, compute, database, and storage. Now, as we walk through this, compute comes in two flavors, what we call roles, a web role and a worker role. There are some other variations to that today, but we'll just focus on those for the moment. A web role is really a virtual machine for hosting IIS-based applications. So for those of you that may be from an Apache world, IIS is really just our version of Apache. It's a web server that I can throw applications into. The web roles come with that particular application server already configured and up and running. All we have to do is have our apps installed into it. The worker role is, for all sense purposes, it's a VM for everything else. So if you, say, really wanted to run Apache in Windows Azure or some kind of JVM, you could probably use a worker role to do that. There's not already an, an, a web application server up and running, so you can install your own, take off and run with it. But what's important about these two things and something that really differentiates them from the world most of us are operating in is these particular roles or VMs are stateless, meaning that if something goes wrong and one of them has to be restarted, it reverts back to its original state. And I know some of you may be going, now, wait a minute, why would that be a good thing? You have to remember we're trying to build systems that scale out near infinitely, okay? And when we do that, trying to persist state information on all those machines can become a really high burden. So we want to start thinking about architecting our applications so they're not nearly as dependent on having that real-time state information close to them. If you think in terms of a web application, you have session state that you'll have to manage, but the application itself really isn't too concerned about things. It might have some local caching going on, but it's persisting the state of any operations it's doing in a back-end database system. So it really doesn't affect a web server much at all in reality, but it's an important piece to keep track of. The next piece we'll move on to is the databases, which in the Windows Azure world really refer to a relational database system such as SQL Server or its cloud counterpart, SQL Azure. SQL Azure is just like SQL Server, probably 90%. There's some nice blog posts out there. You can go to see the differences, but it's still really a T-SQL-based database system. It just has a few limitations that we don't have on-prem. The next area up is storage. Storage differs from databases in the fact that it's not intended to be a relational database store. Now, these three storage systems we have over here, blobs, queues, and tables, can be used to create relational systems but they're not inherently designed to support things like a relational SQL query that we're used to. They're intended to give us a high degree of scalability. Now, the way they do this is by highly specialized duties and different internal structures. We won't get completely down into this, but we will talk briefly through what the high-level parts are here. The first is blob storage. You really need to think of blob storage as a filing cabinet or, in more traditional development terms, maybe a network file share. At the top level of a blob, I have a container, and inside that container, I can put files, and you'll even see that the file names can contain paths that look just like a directory structure when I'm sitting with a folder structure and the network file share on premise. So it gives us just a, a holding block that we can put anything in. It's literally the junk drawer of our kitchens brought to the cloud so we can put anything we need in it. The next step are our queues. For those of you that are not familiar with queuing systems, it's really just a simple mechanism for exchanging me messages. I can put a message in one side of a queue, and somebody will read it out of the other. It includes basic queuing semantics, like being able to control how many people can read a message. In this case, only one at a time can read it. It then has an exclusive lock on it. You can operate on that message, and let's say something fails. If you forget to renew the lock, it'll become visible again to somebody else or when you're finished processing, you just delete it. So it gives you a, a decoupling mechanism between two different worker processes. So if somebody's uploading, say, a file, and you want to convert that file over to a thumbnail when it's done, you could have the uploading process put a message into the queue saying, okay, somebody needs to create the thumbnail, and when they're done, they could put a message in another queue back to you saying we finished it. And it really gives you a, a sense of a temporal decoupling, which can become in really a, really useful when you get into circumstances of high load and you want to start balancing things and spreading the load around. And lastly, we have tables. Now, you really need to think of these like an Excel spreadsheet. 
they're not tables as we've gotten used to thinking about them over the last 20 years. If you've been around a little bit longer like me, you may remember the days of multi-record format files back in the mid-range and mainframe days. That's really more akin to what table storage in Windows Azure is about. It gives you a single index and the ability to store essentially key value pairs in a given row, but every row can have a different format. Now that can have some uses sometimes. It takes a little bit to wrap your head around. I'm not going to spend any time dwelling on it today. Just understand that if you're looking at using table storage, it's not a relational database system, and you don't want to treat it like one. Now, as I mentioned, those were the core services to Windows Azure. There's a lot of other pieces that are out there. The service bus, access control, the caching service, the list goes on and on, and it seems like we're adding new ones every three to six months. But those are really going to be a session for another day. We could easily do an hour to two hours to four hours on any one of these subjects. So for today, I really want to just focus on those core services and most importantly, just on the compute and the storage. So that's it with Windows Azure. Hopefully you got kind of at least a feel for it. I know it's high level, but I really want to start talking about PHP and Windows Azure. Now, Microsoft and open source have never had the friendliest of relationships, but with the Windows Azure platform, they really focused on trying to change that. The underlying APIs are very open. You can really have a rich degree of interoperability between third-party languages or non-Microsoft languages and the actual APIs that are exposed from Windows Azure. In my opinion, one of the richest of these is the Windows Azure SDK for PHP. It was first created by a gentleman out of, um, I get this right, it was either Netherlands or, the Bel or Belgium, I can't remember which, I always screw it up. But Martin, who is a wonderful gentleman, very committed to both PHP and Windows Azure, created the very first version of this SDK back in 2009. The, since it's very first inception, he's continually been innovating it, sometimes so far as seeing a feature at a, on a blog post or in a news group that's something added to Windows Azure and adding it to the SDK that day or within a couple of days. So it has continued to be the richest, most widely supported third-party SDK for Azure that's out there. Some of the other ones are coming up, but this one I still think beats them all. The latest version of it starts using templates to generate Windows Azure applications. So it's a command line based tooling that really allows you to remain dependent of any IDE. In the past, there was an Eclipse plugin you can use that interfaced with this, but after a bit of playing with it, I found the command line actually makes it a lot easier and allows you to use whatever editor you want. No more are you dependent on, well, I gotta go over to Eclipse and set up the project and then I can flip back over to say, TextPad++ or whatever my other favorite editors are to do the editing. It's all right there at your fingertips and you can even create your own extension points for it. It has support within the SDK for both local as well as cloud-hosted deployments, and it even includes some PHP-specific things that you'll have to address, like session handling. So one thing I didn't mention earlier was Windows Azure doesn't support the nature of sticky sessions, which most of us have gotten very used to having. So when we start building a solution in Windows Azure, having something like a built-in session handler we can use right out of the gate is really handy. Now this is all available for you up on phpazure.codeplex.com, but you can also pull it down through the Windows Platform Installer. There's a post on my blog for how to get this and some of the other bits if you want. But just go out, tag it, download it, run it. There's really nothing to it and it's really easy to get started. So when you install the SDK, what you'll end up finding is it places a series of files down underneath Program Files, Windows Azure SDK for PHP. The first folder we'll really want to look at is the bin folder. In here you see a a various sets of bat files and PowerShell scripts. What these end up doing for us, these are the heart and soul of the SDK. There's two of them we're going to end up looking at today, Package and Scaffolder, that allow us to help set up our projects. So when you first install the SDK, you may want to drop a path variable setting in to make this directory a little more accessible. The next one we're going to look at is underneath that same directory, there'll be a library slash Microsoft slash Windows Azure folder. Now in here is all the custom PHP scripts that are going to allow us to consume 
Windows Azure resources more easily. We'll walk in through this a little bit more depth, but you can see in here we've got some things like our session handler, a storage include file, even some role environment stuff so we can understand what's going on in Windows Azure. By simply including these and bringing them into our project, we gain the richness of Windows Azure added to a PHP app with no real additional work.